I'm Roger Bradbury. I'm the uh, Director of Academic Research and Outreach, I believe it's called, at the college. And I'm standing in for Professor Lestrange tonight. He had to go uh, suddenly to Melbourne and was unavailable. So, and I'd like to introduce Dr Nick Koo, who's going to be speaking to us tonight. Nick is a China Foreign Affairs Specialist, and we, we're really privileged to have him here. He's, uh, he's come to us from University of Otago, and the work he's going to talk about tonight is part of a research project he's been doing with us uh, for the last little while, which will come out as an NSC working paper and eventually in, in a book, uh, hopefully from Georgetown University Press. Nick's uh, background is uh, his undergraduate at the University of California, uh, then Johns Hopkins, and Columbia, you said, as well, and Columbia, so impeccable pedigree, and it's, it's really our privilege to welcome him here tonight to talk about China in transition and its, uh, and its rise in international politics. Thank you. I'd like to thank ANU and National Security College for actually funding uh, this piece of research. Uh, it allowed me to actually make a trip to Beijing to uh, spend three weeks at Peking University and to engage with Chinese academics. So uh, this research is informed by interviews I had with Chinese academics at, at various institutions in Beijing. Uh, and they really provided some leverage and insight into some of this uh, interesting work that I've found uh, in respect to Chinese foreign policy and security policy recently. And as you know, if you've been following in the newspapers, I don't think you can understand the contemporary international scene without understanding or appreciating China's role in it, right? And what I'm going to try and do today is, rather than give you the blow-by-blow -blow account of events in respect to Sino-Japanese relations or uh, China's re relations with specific Southeast Asian states, such as Vietnam, the Philippines. I'm trying to step back a little bit and look at something a little more deeper, which is how we conceptualize China as an actor in the system. Now, this may sound like, okay, here we go again, another academic with this concept and so forth. But um, I think the best research tries to integrate theory with empirical facts. And hopefully, I will succeed in doing this uh, today. So um, you're the best judge for this. I'm going to present a number of standard views of how you understand China as an international actor. And then we'll look at uh, empirical developments in Chinese foreign policy and kind of uh, bring them together nicely. Right? OK, so basically, uh, this research project has to deal with China's Asia policy, and specifically since 2009. So it's quite recent. Right? Um, Prior to that, uh, there had been a view, uh, and I would say it's probably the conventional wisdom prior to 2009, that China had been remarkably successful in conducting its diplomacy from roughly the period from 1997 uh, to 2008, uh, start of the Olympics, right? Uh, if we ever accepted that view, uh, it is now uh, no longer the, the kind of standard view. It's a much more complex picture we have of China and Chinese foreign policy in large part because of some of the events that we're going to talk about today and that deal specifically with China's Asia policy. Okay? I'm going to introduce a number of con competing conceptualizations of how China is viewed uh, in the academic uh, arena among academics, talk about why it matters, these are the particular perspectives that uh, we will run through. Uh, China as a trading state, very standard approach to understanding China in the kind of reform era, right? To view China as a state that's focused primarily on economics, right? There's a more kind of subtle uh, view that's advanced by some academics, which is that we really need to look at China's identity, right? Um, how does China conceive of itself as an international actor uh, in respect to the international arena. Another perspective, uh, a little more complex, China as a social state, talking about non-material aspects, things that go on in between uh, people's heads. Um, China as a normative actor, uh, advancing kind of uh, uh, processes that we categorize as socialization processes, right? Uh, and that is an influential view uh, in, in the literature. 
And finally, there's this view that China is a neo-real estate. That is actually uh, the perspective I tend to uh, be more sympathetic to. Uh, we'll look at these cases. If we have uh, sufficient time, uh, I suspect we won't. But during the Q&A session, we can actually uh, go into greater detail. Right? Then we'll wrap it up. Okay. So what are these uh, conceptions of China? Uh, there is this standard view that China is best seen as a trading state. Right? Uh, then, of course, the identity side of things, a number of academics have advanced this view, the social state and the neo-real estate. Right? Before we even go there, why even bother with concepts? Um, believe it or not, when you try to understand uh, international politics by reading a newspaper, you're actually filtering through that information uh, with an understanding of a state in a certain specific context, right? Um, we, we do not have an atheoretical view of world politics. Every one of us has a certain understanding of the news that we read. And that is the claim that academics will make uh, and would insist, therefore, you need to send your kids to university. Because this actually makes a lot of sense. It helps you to simplify and understand the world. <clears throat> So to the extent that we seek to understand the world, we will look at it in theoretical terms, whether we appreciate it or not. <clears throat> that is my claim, at least. China today, in the view of some academics, uh, is a liberal state in the sense that it emphasizes economics, right? Positive sum gains, attention to comparative advantage. It's a standard economic terms right out of Adam Smith, gains from trade the emphasis on traditional military security concerns. That is the kind of perspective advanced by the trading state view. Example would be Richard Rosecrans from, uh, he was at Cornell for a while, then UCLA. Uh, now he's at Harvard, he's an emeritus professor there. Um, we need to understand what kind of state China is because if you accept this view that China is a social state, it is definitely not what is called a real estate, right? Uh, social state theorists use this concept of socialization in very different ways from neo-realists who also use the concept. So a uh, standard uh, person who looks at it in social state terms would be Johnston, and this would be uh, against the uh, Waltzian view, right? Uh, this view that China is an identity state, well, it's definitely not the same thing as the liberal state view, right? So academics disagree. I mean, that's not news to us, right? They, that's their job, to disagree, right? One thing that unites these various perspectives on China is that they're definitely not taking the neo-real estate view. Now, as a member of the public, you might say, well, this is a fancy uh, academic term. What, what does neo-real estate mean? What it basically means is actually standard great power politics, which we're all quite familiar with, right? This is the idea that strong states basically run the international system. Now, there are obviously very clear exceptions to this, but for the most part throughout history, you'll see that over the long term, great powers tend to be the big movers that set the agenda in terms of history. They tend to dictate what happens to the smaller states in the international system. Now, you can obviously get into more complex variations of this, but that's basically a standard realist model, right? So all these theorists tend to take their cue from the neo-realist perspective, right? So for example, Elsa Johnston argues that uh, balanced power theory, which is basically realist theory, uh, is not a useful explanation for Chinese security behavior. Right? David Shambaugh, an eminent expert on China from the States, makes basically the same uh, claim. Uh, and he argues that realist theory, or this perception that China is, is a real estate, is not particularly helpful in explaining this dynamic environment, which is Asia. Right? And he argues very clearly in terms of policy advice against the United States adopting a quote-unquote realist view of the world, and in, in particular to respond to China's rise in very realist terms. David Kang from the University of Southern California, also a very uh, eminent uh, academic, argues that China's experience over the past two decades has posed a challenge to realist theory. Right? So all these eminent theorists uh, would advance a view of China but one thing they do agree is that China is not a real estate. That actually is a position that I will be taking, right? So let's kind of dig through these various interpretations of China and let's see whether they actually make a lot of sense or not, right? 
what is the core claim of trading state theory, right? <coughs> Basically, that increased trade significantly reduces incentive for conflict, right? Thus, Grosskranz argues that in a world of trading states, the incentive to wage war is absent, for war disrupts trade. This is the basic standard argument Norman Agel argued prior to World War I, right? Just a variation thereof, right? Scholars more recently have argued that if this trading state view is true, then what we will see uh, moving ahead the next two, three decades is basically a capitalist peace. So for example, China, quasi-capitalist state that it is, if it develops its capitalist practices and institutions, can actually have an alignment of interest with other capitalist states in the international system, including the United States, the UK, Australia, New Zealand, et cetera, et cetera, right? So it's quite a promising view if it's true, right? At face value, the case of viewing China as a trading state is rather impressive, right? 15 to 17% growth over the last 30 years. And in fact, the Chinese themselves have picked up the queue, right? A Chinese official in December of 2013 argued, quote, China has overtaken the United States to become the world's largest trading country in goods in 2013 for the first time. So this is not a view that is totally plucked out of thin air. There are hard facts, right? Academics has also uh, kind of picked up on this argue, argument. Shambao, uh, in a very kind of uh, important ar article in international security, argues that China is increasingly at the center of economic interdependence in Asia, right? And it's hard to deny that is true, right? If you look at the facts and figures, if anything, this case has actually become stronger over time. 2003, trade between China and the entire Asian region was about 500 billion. By 2010, Chinese trade with its top eight or top six Asian trading partners alone was worth nearly 900 billion, right? 2003, six of China's top trading partners from the Asia Pacific region. By 2010, this number had increased to eight, and this includes the United States as an Asian uh, um, actor. Academics have gone further, argued that, quote, in Eric Veed's conclusion, from an international trade perspective, all of East Asia has recently become a Chinese sphere of influence, right? Problem is that there's lack of evidence, right? What do I mean? In this perspective, what you should see with all this integration and rising trade is that increased trade and economic ties will lead to a decline in conflict. What have we seen over the last couple of years? Actually, the converse we've actually seen an increase in conflict that has accompanied China's rise, uh, in particular since 2009. So basically on empirical grounds, you have high trade, high conflict. So something is missing in this perspective, right? So that kind of probes us to, to really look deeper, right? What's really going on? If you look at China's relationships with certain states in the post-Cold War era, the US-China relationship, 1995-96, you remember the Taiwan Straits crisis. Right? China and the United States are deeply locked in an economic relationship, yet that did not prevent that crisis from uh, basically rocking the entire region. Right? Interestingly enough, uh, you know, we shouldn't only focus on China in explaining uh, regional developments. In that particular crisis, 1995-96, it arguably would not have happened without the catalytic role of Li Teng-hui as, uh, as Taiwan's leader. He was the one who was probing uh, and basically carving out space, living space for Taiwan. That was a key catalyst for that crisis, right? And ironically, he, uh, representative of Taiwan, is representing a country that in this trading state literature is one of the kind of role models for trading states, right? So that's very interesting. And what I'm suggesting actually that trading state theory is actually very apolitical. Right? And therefore, we need to kind of take its conclusions and its assertions with a huge grain of salt. Now, let's look at China's relations with other states in the Asian region. Right? Because you could argue that the US-China relationship is quite atypical in the sense that it talks about two great powers. Right? Let's look at Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, which actually we've already looked at uh, in terms of Li Teng Hui. But in terms of Japan and South Korea, high levels of trade, number one, number two trading partners. Yet at the same time, 
we've seen sharp friction over the last 10 years, right? Cursory familiarity with the Sino-Japanese relationship uh, already kind of raises eyebrows, right? Uh, they are deeply engaged in economic trade, yet at the same time, we know purely from the history of the last five, six years, there has been intense conflict, right? So clearly the theory might capture something, but it misses a lot, right? These are the kind of facts and figures. Um, China, Japan's uh, number one, number two top trading partner. Uh, yet at the same time, for both states, they view each other as a key security concern, right? And also, uh, merely to mention the whole issue and topic of nationalism, you get the point straight away, right? Major focus of nationalism on both sides, right? And you might say, well, okay, you know, World War II, we understand the Sino-Japanese relationship has problems and deep ones at that. But even the Sino-South Korean relationship over the last 10 years, right? You had a number of crises ranging from the uh, Kogurio history issue to territorial disputes to even disagreements over how to handle the North Korean issue, right? And so this suggests that economic interdependence is trading state ideas, a partial understanding of what's really going on. Central point is that we need to move beyond economics and start talking politics. International relations is not equivalent to international, uh, you know, a focus on purely economic issues. You need to move beyond economics, right? International relations encompasses military issues in addition to economic issues, as well as other issues such as uh, nationalism, et cetera, et cetera. Another view, very influential, argues that China is an identity state. Right? A focus on aspects of Chinese identity to explain how China uh, acts as an international actor in the system. David Kang's argument he, uh, from United, University of Southern California uh, argues that um, identity is the key to understand why Asian states have actually accommodated China's rise. Now, this book came out in 2007. And since then, obviously, uh, I'd argue his findings and claims need to be uh, taken with uh, some measure of uh, salt, really. Uh, he has predicted that there would be accommodation of China's rise, right, among regional states. He argues that there's actually very low perceptions of threat of China's rise in the international system and Asia more generally. This concept, actually, of identity sounds plausible, but actually, in terms of, I think, where academic analysis can help. The more you unpack identity, the tougher it becomes to be convinced of this, right? Even if you look at yourself as Australians uh, and myself as a, as a Kiwi now, um, what part of identity do you talk about? Um, is it the identity from the 19th century? Is it the present identity? Is it uh, Australia's identity in the 21st century as a multicultural nation? How has identity transformed over time? These things are very complex, right? And I don't think that we've actually come to firm and hard conclusions, right? And the same goes for Chinese identity. Uh, we really need to interrogate uh, this concept rather than accept it uh, definitively as an issue. And in fact, when you look at some of this analysis advanced by academics, uh, when you look at identity, it's very hard to kind of piece it together quite coherently in terms of understanding Chinese foreign policy, right? So Kang, to get a bit more uh, kind of uh, uh, clear about it, he talks about identity causing a relatively benign view of China's rise to occur in the region. And in fact, we know actually empirically uh, over the last four or five years, that actually is not what's happening. There are very kind of severe and high levels of threat, right? He cannot explain the high level of conflict that's actually going on in the region. Right? So it just kind of indicates to us he was writing his book at a time when it seemed like China's rise was relatively peaceful. He can explain that, but he can't explain the corresponding conflict that has occurred in later years. Right? So identity can't really do what's demanded of it, basically. There's weak evidence, in effect, which is key in terms of uh, social science research. Right? Another view is that China is a social state that is amenable to kind of counter real politics, counter realist uh, processes, right? In this respect, Johnston talks about how Chinese participation in international institutions such as the uh, East Asian Forum 
the ASEAN Regional Forum, has actually socialized China, right? Chinese diplomats, by participating in these institutions, get socialized to the kind of Asian way of trying to deal with conflict in a way that doesn't escalate conflict, right? So therefore, the advice would be get China into institutions, talk to them, deal with them constructively, and a more kind of peaceful rise will occur, right? There will be a convergence of preferences in this view, right? Common beliefs will emerge. He talks about micro processes of mimicking social influence and persuasion that get activated uh, among diplomats, right? In fact, however, there's relatively weak evidence uh, for these claims. What do I mean? If you actually look at Chinese behavior at international institutions, such as the Copenhagen Climate Change uh, Summit, and you can ask Kevin Rudd about this, uh, he was infuriated with the Chinese behavior, as you may have read in the newspapers at the time. And this actually uh, carries on into the East Asian Summit. China's conflict with the uh, Japanese have played out in these summit meetings in full view of all the Asian states. Uh, in the ASEAN meetings, the same thing has happened too, right? Just to get a little more specific about this, at the 2012 ASEAN summit uh, in June and November, um, China basically practiced great power politics. There's no two ways about it, right? Uh, this occurred uh, very clearly. All the states were quite apprised of what was going on. And in the face of this, what has happened is, is that ASEAN's consensus model has broken down, right? So we really have to ask ourselves, um, if these other models don't explain, what does? And I would argue that actually what we're seeing now in the international system with China's rise in Asia and also with Russia in Europe is actually a return to a different era. In some senses, it's kind of going back to history, right? Uh, we're seeing the reemergence of great power politics. Real politic in the old fashion has come back, right? Now, this would be a great surprise to a lot of academics who've actually thought that real politics uh, needs to be thrown in the dustbin of history. But I would argue and I present with evidence uh, that actually there's a lot to kind of go for this uh, realist uh, perspective on international politics. What I'm basically advancing is neorealism as a theory of foreign policy. It's a dominant perspective uh, in the realist understanding of international politics. Colin Elman is one of the kind of key uh, academics in that respect. So I'm arguing that if you use basic realist concepts, you can understand what China uh, is doing in Asia and more generally in the international system. China, like great powers before, is seeking to maximize its security. It has interests, it has a sphere of influence in East Asia that has existed for hundreds of years. Um, and in fact, for the last 150 years or so, China has been relatively weak and therefore was not able to exercise its interests to the full degree that it has uh, intended, right? So what we see as China has been rising over the last few years is that you get some degree of conflict um, and you get balancing dynamics occurring in the sense that regional states are reacting to China and you get the activation of what's called the security dilemma, right? Now this is a concept that argues that states seek to advance their interests, they seek to maximize their security. Other states also seek to do the same thing and that you get a kind of spiral effect occurring in the international system, right? That's exactly what's going on in Asia in the current period of time. Um, in terms of cooperation, moving forward, um, great power politics would suggest that great powers, those with greater material capabilities and deep foreign policy interests in specific issues will seek to actually get their way, right? So with the recent developments in the South China Sea, that's actually what's happening, right? Uh, the Vietnamese are trying their best to kind of maximize their position against a strong Chinese state that is equally intent on maximizing its security interests. And no surprise who seems to be winning, right? At the same time, some of you in the audience might say, well, this sounds like great theory, but where's the history? And as a China foreign policy specialist, I want to argue that yes, we need area studies, uh, understanding, and we need a deep understanding, right? Theory doesn't explain everything. You need to have area studies uh, knowledge to understand the exceptions to theory because states 
do sometimes act in ways that are strange. What do I mean? The current era we live in is one of US dominance. In academic terms, it's known as unipolarity, right? During the Cold War, we had bipolarity, the Soviets and the US. If you use pure logic, the Russians and the Chinese should be balancing against the United States. But that actually doesn't seem to be occurring. A big reason for this has to do with the Cold War, where the Soviets and the Chinese had an alliance, but they had a massive falling out, right? Um, and as a result, if you look from the historical lens, you can begin to understand why it doesn't really make sense for the uh, Russians and the Chinese to gang up again against the United States, because they still have that legacy. In fact, uh, I got a taste of this when I first went to China in 1995, because uh, they looked at me and they said, uh, because I could speak Mandarin, and they said, okay, you must be Russian. And I said, no, I'm from Singapore. Uh, my, my dad's uh, ethnic Chinese. Uh, and then I start talking to them in Mandarin, and then they're your best friend, right? So, you know, a little bit of the human touch, but I think we need to emphasize language studies. Uh, if you want to connect with the Chinese, if you want the 21st century not to be about doom and gloom, we need to connect, we need to engage with the Chinese. Um, it may be true that some degree of security conflict, security maximization based conflict will occur. That's quite inevitable, it's understandable. But at the same time, there's a role for human agency and diplomacy in this. That's why I'm not doom and gloom. I understand that security concerns will occur, but there's a role for diplomacy in mitigating that picture, right? Okay, since uh, 2009, China has been largely reactive, revisionist to varying degrees, and not particularly skillful in its diplomacy. Right? In, if you look at these various issues, South China Sea, Japan's North Korea policy, China has been relatively reactive and revisionist. Right? Now, that's actually not much of a surprise. Uh, but I would argue that if you really want to understand what's going on in international relations in Asia over the last four or five years, you also need to give agency to the other actors in the system, and in Asia in particular. Um, the Vietnamese, the Japanese, the Philippines uh, have their own interests, which they are seeking to push. Um, the Vietnamese-Chinese dispute in respect to the South China Sea uh, has kick-started again in respect to the Paracel Islands, because the Vietnamese disagree with what has happened in the history. In respect to 1974, that's when the Chinese uh, basically took over the Paracel Islands, uh, and therefore the Chinese feel that they are entitled to actually drill for oil. Vietnamese take a different view, and as a result, we get conflict that's erupted over the last few weeks, in particular with the uh, oil rig issue, right, which you've heard about in the press, right? Uh, if the Vietnamese had chosen not to push this issue, you'd have no conflict, right? Very simple. But the Vietnamese have chosen to stake out a stand on this issue, and we get some degree of conflict erupting. You get riots within Vietnam, as you would have heard in the press. Right? Uh, the Philippines uh, has been trying its best to get the United States involved in the South China Sea disputes that it has with China. Right? Um, the Japan Japanese in the East China Sea are also seeking to actually get the United States more involved. Right? That's why a evolving and very interesting piece of research that really needs to be pushed moving forward is actually uh, not just China's rise and the implications of that, but also how the United States manages its alliance relationships in East Asia. That is the other part of a very interesting picture as the, the kind of region moves forward. And you can't just study Chinese foreign policy and say that's the end of Asian IR. No, you need to look at the other side, which is how the United States uh, as the key anchor in the region manages its alliance relationships. The stability of Asia has got to do with more than just China's behavior. It's going to also have to do or be an outcome of and a function of how the regional states respond to China's rise. So it's really kind of a, a big jigsaw puzzle where multiple players will actually have a role to play in the stability of the international system. In this respect, my concern is also with uh, the leadership or lack thereof exercised by the United States uh, under Obama uh, administration, right? U.S. foreign policy in East Asia uh, has too often been distracted by events in other parts of the world that are of 
understandably of immediate and drastic concern to it, but at the same time, it risks neglecting the region. Right? So I would say, as a result of, of some of these discussions I've had with uh, uh, regional academics, uh, that there is a perception that the United States is actually not really pulling its weight in respect to alliance management. Right? What that means is the United States actually needs to exercise a leadership role in its alliance relationship with the Japanese. The Japanese cannot always get what they want. If they take a hard line against the Chinese and push the boundaries uh, of the East China Sea disputes, the United States has a role in mitigating uh, kind of the aggressive stance adopted by the Japanese at times, right? So it's quite a tough job, I have to say, but a necessary one. How are we doing on time? Okay, okay another five minutes? Okay. Um, part of my research looked at Sino-Japanese relations, but at the same time, I'd like to point out that equally important moving forward is actually looking at the uh, Chinese relationship with uh, ASEAN, and also, uh, surprisingly enough, also the Chinese relationship with North Korea, right? So this will all be explored in the working paper that is that's published by uh, ANU, and the National Security College. But um, what I'm going to give you, because of the kind of shortage of time, is just kind of run through the Sino-Japanese relationship, right? And if we can, we'll talk about the other relationships in the Q&A. OK. Um, Sino-Japanese relations, uh, China's played a prominent role uh, in escalating conflict, there's no doubt. But one of the interesting things uh, that emerges when you talk to Chinese academics is that they don't necessarily seem th see themselves as being very aggressive. Now, what is the Chinese view then? Chinese view is that they're responding to moves that have been taken by the Japanese, right? So for example, the Senkaku disputes in 2012. Uh, if you look at it kind of coldly, it was basically the nationalization of the Senkaku Islands that really was the catalyst that caused the Chinese to react. Right? So it was an action on the Japanese side that really changed the status quo. The Chinese are right on that. Right? The Japanese altered the status quo. Now, we may understand why uh, they altered the status quo, but that doesn't change the fact that it was the Japanese that altered the status quo. Right? So as a result, you had a process that was activated where you get intense conflict between the Chinese and the Japanese. So that's why I say the Japanese have agency in this, in this uh, broad picture too. And also another question that emerges is where is the United States in this picture? Because it's not sufficient to just look at the Chinese and the Japanese and, and lament the deterioration in regional stability. We also have to look at the United States role because the United States has, since 1945, if not before, played a major role in the stability of the region, right? So whenever you have uh, heightened instability, one question to ask yourself is, where's the United States in all of this, right? Three episodes uh, in, in recent years, um, fall 2010, the Chinese fishing boat incident, um, August to September 2012, the Senkaku uh, Deoyutai Islands, again uh, in, uh, November 2012, you get the uh, Xi Jinping regime coming in, new leadership. Uh, for a while, it was suspected that perhaps we might get a stabilization, but actually what we have is a converse, right? You get escalation of Sino-Japanese relations. Okay. I'm actually going to go quickly to the Xi Jinping uh, uh, transition because that's actually dealing with more recent events, right? Um, Really, it kickstarts in December of 2012, right, where you get uh, Japanese fighters being scrambled to intercept a Chinese maritime surveillance aircraft uh, that was fly flying over the disputed Daoyutai Islands. Um, you get a kind of action-reaction cycle that's been going on. The Japanese defense minister claimed that a PLA naval vessel had activated its missile guidance uh, system and painted a Japanese maritime force vessel, basically targeting it, right, giving a clear signal that it could be shot down if, if, if required, right? Um, the Japanese defense minister was quite explicit. He considered that uh, a threat to use force, which would have potentially escalated if it actually came about. Now, one of the things that has intrigued uh, researchers is 
The perception that perhaps the Chinese themselves are rather disorganized and perhaps less than a truly rational actor in a sense that they have multiple agencies that deal with these territorial disputes, right? And that is true. If you look at the Chinese bureaucracy, there are multiple, region, uh, multiple agencies that deal with this regional dispute, right? Now, what's interesting with the Xi Jinping regime is that he came in after this apparent uh, lack of organization to some extent. So in a sense, it's a test case of him asserting control, and yet at the same time, we see there's a clear escalation occurring in Sino-Japanese relations. So the reason for the escalation in Sino-Japanese relations and conflict in that relationship cannot be necessarily due to disorganization. Because one thing we know is that Xi Jinping has begun to consolidate his power in respect to the military, right? More recently, you would have heard of the uh, air defense identification zone issue, right? China has declared an ADIZ over the East China Sea. There's a 50% overlap between China's ADIZ and Japan's ADIZ. This declaration came after Xi Jinping assumed the mantle of leadership. It is a policy that he owns. And therefore, there's no doubt that the Chinese are now pressing the Japanese, right? The Japanese may have started this issue, but the Chinese are now pressing this issue, and it's very clear that they're staking out a claim, right? So the United States has been dragged into this uh, belatedly and responded to the ADIZ uh, announcement by basically challenging the declaration and flying through two B-52 bombers. Seoul and Tokyo followed suit with their sorties. Now, moving forward, uh, this is probably a watershed moment in regional IR. And if there's going to be conflict, this would be an issue to kind of pay close attention to. Because this is one of the events that, uh, if you kind of trace it back, uh, in terms of the last 20 years of Sino-Japanese relations, this is a clear incident where the Chinese have decided to stake their claim, right? And in respect to the Japanese, uh, if anything, it's actually caused the Japanese to adopt an even more hard line, right? And events since then have uh, kind of suggested this. Right? The Americans have definitely taken a, a relatively tough line in respect to this. Um, of course, the skeptics among you may say that this is all words, and what's actually occurring on the ground is more important. Now, I talked about how moving forward and looking at Asian IR, we really need to look at more than just China. And if you look at the Japanese side of things, the Abe government has not actually uh, covered itself in glory in, the, in respect to this event. Uh, Abe made a visit to the Yashukuni Shrine on 26 December 2013. That has been a catalyst in the escalation in Sino-Japanese relations too, right? It led to a uh, Chinese foreign ministry spokesman taking the unusual step of directly criticizing Abe for honoring fascists and the Nazis of Asia. So this is really serious stuff, right? Interestingly enough, a uh, quote from the U.S. side, uh, an unnamed U.S. official observed that Abe's Yasushuni Shrine visit made U.S.-China diplomacy, quote-unquote, useless, right? So I think this brings home this point about how um, great powers have a large uh, say in how regional relations work out. But at the same time, alliance partners also have an important agency role in the trajectory of Asian IR, right? Okay, I think we have a lot of ground to cover more, uh, but uh, unfortunately I don't have time, and I think I'll leave it to the Q&A session to kind of flesh out some of the more uh, detailed issues that may come up uh, in respect to questions. Uh, g'day, uh, Timmy Hogan. Um, you, uh, you didn't have a time to talk about ASEAN, but I just wanted to get your thoughts on ways ASEAN could deal with um, issues, uh, territorial issues around the South China Sea. Um, it, there's lots of territorial disputes, not only with um, uh, China and Japan, but also a lot of uh, countries uh, in, that, in that group. And I just wanted to hear your thoughts. Yes. Uh, if anything, the emerging threat that uh, the ASEAN states feel uh, in respect to China is actually causing them to actually cooperate a little bit more. So Indonesia and Philippines recently reached some kind of agreement, 
uh, to kind of shelve their own dispute and actually they enter into negotiations. So to me, that's not such a big issue, right? It's, it's, uh, it's a relatively minor issue that can be settled with enough time, focus, and energy. So I'm not too particularly concerned with, with that uh, because I think that fundamentally when you're dealing with ASEAN, the states are in an institution. They've been at these discussions with themselves over multiple issues for over 40 years, right? So they have that habit of dialogue to settle the disputes. The interesting thing with ASEAN is that they many times agree to disagree. They may not be able to settle an issue this year, although they'll carry on talking. And that's actually what we want and hope that perhaps the Chinese and the Japanese can adopt a similar attitude. Now, of course, straight away, uh, it's a whole uh, different question, right? Once you're talking about Japan and China in respects to territorial disputes, because uh, there's a degree of antagonism that doesn't exist between any particular ASEAN state, right? In respect to territorial disputes. So it's, it's kind of hard to actually compare uh, Sino-Japanese relations with any particular ASEAN relationship, but hopefully that's, that's possible with enough diplomacy on the Chinese and the Japanese side. However, at this point in time, we're not at that point. Right? So it, it will be a situation which uh, will require a lot of effort on the part of the Chinese and the Japanese. Right? It, there needs to be a will for there to be a way. Does that help to answer a little bit? Thank you very much, Dr. Hu, for the very interesting uh, presentations. I'm Hai. I'm from the Strategic and Defense Studies Center at NU here. And, um, uh, I'm a bit convinced by your argument that China is in your real estate and that we see in the, in, throughout the history that China behavior is really indicate, you know, the, the third for, for, you know, the recognition of its power in the region. But I may disagree uh, with your, your, your assessment in the South China Sea, uh, uh, situation that China is reactive to other country. I mean, other country active. I mean, it's very difficult to point out what 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 is the beginning of the you know, the cycle of uh, action and reactions. But clearly, uh, we see that in the in the. I mean, first one is it, what do you expect that uh, Vietnam should you know respond if China use force to expel the you know, Vietnamese force out of the Paracels Island and in 1974. So definitely, it have to it have a voice to have to voice its opposition to that kind of actions, and it has not really, uh, relinquished you know, the the claim to the 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 islands, and definitely it have to, you know to say there, and also if we look into the change of action or reaction in the South China Sea, I think that smaller country have very little incentive to poke China and to. I mean, and if you look at, you know, the oil rig recently, you know, uh, there are two matter here. First one is a, because it's the international law, the UNCLOS, and the oil rig is beyond the, beyond the Paracel Islands, you know, w territorial sea, right? And of course, let alone the, the islands are disputed. And China accept that is a disputed area, but it's still put in the oil rig there. That is a provocation, right? And also the second, and I think it's better to to point out. I mean, it's it's very hard to is it, it the level of the the international law here, the UNCLOS, and whether China will accept that or not. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, there was a lot packed into there. Yes. I will. I will. Uh, uh, I'll actually uh, point to the to something you didn't mention which is that I think in the midst of all these specific problems and issues you're talking about, you're right, action and reaction, it really depends on where you start measuring what's the action and what's the reaction. And uh, the Chinese themselves will go back to 1951 and they will say uh, the problem started there. Uh, and, you know, who's to argue whose starting point is the right starting point, right? Uh, and in respect to this particular presentation, I'm talking about uh, much more recent starting point, right? So that's a good point of clarification. At the end of the day, though, it's actually the United States that is probably going to be the one that really makes the difference on whether these issues get resolved or not, right? Uh, Vietnam understands that it's not going to be able to thwart the Chinese, right? You're going to need a balancer. The Chinese respect power, What's a stronger power than Vietnam? 
It's not ASEAN, it's the United States. That's why the regional situation uh, hinges on an active and positive role played by the United States, right? Not a role whereby the United States comes in and uh, does not behave responsibly uh, and in a way that's constructive, right? But in a way in which it <coughs> quietly tells the Chinese that the United States has a deep interest in the stability of the region. Since 1945, the United States has expanded blood and treasure for the stability of the Asia Pacific region. Uh, I see no reason why the Obama administration would actually want to pull back from that position. Having said that, we understand broader developments in, in the international system have caused it to be distracted. But Asia is too important to allow uh, United States distraction cause its instability. Because at the end of the day, when the United States does not pay attention to Asia, regional developments can actually work against US interests. And I think we've seen that in the last four or five years in the region. So I'm pointing to a positive and significant US role in resolving these disputes. Now the mechanics obviously need to be worked out, but I would say uh, key to answering uh, the stability question of Asia lies in a active and engaged US. Uh, Dr. Kerr, David Goyne, it strikes me the really catalytic moment in uh, China's <coughs> relationship with Asia, particularly the United States, is that Taiwan Straits crisis. And at that point, the United States could react forcefully and extremely effectively, and the Chinese didn't really have a response. Quite intelligently, for their own security interests, they've developed a very effective response probably now. Now, no one's ever put it to the test, and I hope they never do, but this has made the stakes for both sides much higher in any confrontation. And so, you know, that probably explains in large part the US hesitance. And the specific follow-up question would be? Um, Where does this go? It, I mean, yeah, uh, okay. uh, you know, your neo-realist view says, no. well, you know, crisis can be managed by diplomacy, yeah. but if you keep rolling the dice, sometimes bad dice are going to come up, and I just don't see how this can be resolved, sure. short of a surrender by Asia sure. to China or war. Well, let, let's kind of ground it down in, in a discussion on the Taiwan issue, yeah. right? Because that's how the question evolved, right? Yeah. That was started out. If you look at the Taiwan issue, uh, notice that the talk today was not about Taiwan. Talk today was about South China Sea, Sino-Japanese relations. That issue has actually been taken off the front burner and put to the back burner, right? Uh, which is very interesting, particularly since we had this crisis in 95, 96. Also, interestingly enough, Taiwan as a society has gone through a, a really kind of deep transition. Uh, you get the emergence of very democratic forces within the country, uh, and yet at the same time, uh, they've under Ma Ying-ju, they've been able to actually reach a sort of modus vivendi with the Chinese. And that's why we don't hear a lot of, uh, about instability in the cross-strait relations. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, when I talk about agency uh, in respect to regional states actually playing a positive role, uh, Taiwan and China actually have managed to work out uh, some kind of relationship that's actually been relatively stable. If you go back to 1979, when, they had the, uh, when the United States had the Taiwan Relations Act, which, by the way, is still in force, and in fact is one of the key reasons why you have stability in the cross-strait relation, right? The United States in the uh, Taiwan Relations Act of 1979 has stated very clearly that it maintains a deep interest in a, a stable uh, and peaceful re resolution of the Taiwan Straits issue. Uh, and therefore, that actually only reinforces the need for an active US presence in the region. Uh, and in fact, 1995-96 highlighted exactly that point, that you needed an engaged United States to have a stable uh, Taiwan Strait relationship. So I think uh, I'm, I'm, I'm quite encouraged by the fact that uh, the Chinese and the Taiwanese have been able to maintain a relatively beneficial relationship. Uh, now we have direct flights between China and Taiwan that didn't exist 20 years ago. So there's actually a fair degree of optimism that can emerge out of looking from the cross strait relationship. Yes, uh, uh, Ben Smith is my name. Look, I'm wondering if you've looked, uh, Dr. Kyu, I'm sure you have actually, of, of, of America's actions against China ever since the founding of the Republic of China. You know that in 1950, 51, 
a man called Dean Rusk, United States uh, Under Secretary for State and Far Eastern Affairs, he subsequently became US Secretary of State. He said the Chinese Revolution was not Chinese at all. It's in his uh, speech and vital speeches of the day. In fact, it was a Moscow plot. The United States kept China out of uh, out of the United Nations for years, saying they're a legal state, uh, uh, not a fit and proper a state. Um, they also, in, uh, um, true, in early 1951, did not discount the possibility of dropping an atom bomb on China and during the various Taiwan crisis, you know, that happened. And we had the unedifying experience of Kissinger and, and Nixon asking on China's back doorstep what good would dropping an atom bomb on Vietnam do? So there's a whole lot of differences here. That the Chinese can see that the Americans have armed Japan. Uh, so there are all sorts of backdrops. They fought a war in, in Korea. The Chinese. Can you bring uh, it to a question? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. I'm using this as a backdrop. The Chinese and the Americans were fighting in Vietnam. So there's there's a very deep suspicion. Uh, on the part of the Chinese Communist Party against the United States. Would you like to comment? Yeah. Um, I don't doubt that there is suspicion on both sides. Uh, that's the nature of great power politics. Um, you know, trust, uh, or rather, you need to verify uh, before you start going into a trusting relationship with any state. So I think, um, uh, you know, let's not kid ourselves. The, the Chinese and the uh, US are all very grown up. They understand they that we all live in a world where states seek their national interests. It's relatively selfish. But at the same time, they both are wise enough to know that they are the states that actually are responsible for stability in the region, if not the world, if, if China really does emerge as a second pole in the system. Um, I don't necessarily see why these specific incidents of history uh, would necessarily cause uh, the U.S. not to actually uh, engage in a positive relationship with China. Uh, after all, they are already uh, in a significant and deep economic relationship, despite all this history that's been cited. Uh, they are you know, each other's uh, top three trading partner, despite this history. So history goes so far in explaining why certain things may or may not occur. But at the same time, you, you know, we move on, right? We move on into a new era. Um, and there are a number of uh, events and issues that have emerged in the recent past which suggest that actually the United States and China can get along. So I'm, I try to see my history in a certain perspective and you know, try and accommodate it to the kind of evolving uh, realities in international politics, not least globalization. Thank you very much for your uh, talk, very interesting. Um, I've got uh, two small questions for you. Um, one is, uh, you mentioned before about how there was this potential internal confusion with inside the Chinese leadership. I'm wondering, would you also perhaps agree with that with the US administration? There was a establishment of the what's called the Air Sea Battle Office uh, relatively recently, and there has been a raging debate over whether it's aimed specifically at China or whether it was a more of a you know uh, inter-force disciplinary kind of move. Um, that's, what, I guess, the first question. Do you believe that those kind of, uh, that, you know, there's been a lot of talk about, you know, the repositioning, the pivot to Asia. You know, has that actually been happening under the Obama administration as much as they would claim it's been happening? The other thing, too, was, and it was interesting you mentioned a little bit about history repeating itself, was uh, the idea perhaps possibly with A to AD technology being um, potentially floated as an idea of, almost like a Lend-Lease program to Vietnam or Philippines or other US allies as a cost-effective way of, sure, you've got your anti-air you know, defense identification zone, but you can't enter it to exploit the resources if we've got our missiles as well. So do you see that as a possibility as well that the US might be venturing towards? Yeah. Thanks. The developments you're talking about, SE battle and A280, um, anti-access, area denial, capabilities that are developing the region are a source for concern. That, there's, that That's actually very good that you pointed out. Um, the Americans are adopting a, a relatively, um, let, let's be blunt about it, it's quite a um, proactive, uh, potentially actually destabilizing development. Um, now they would say they're responding to Chinese actions, right, in respect, in respect to development of technology. 
and in particular missile technology. So there's clearly some kind of action reaction cycle beginning to emerge on the techno military technology front. And moving forward, uh, that needs to be looked at very closely. But at the same time, that is the technology aspect of it. Uh, what actually causes uh, competition in technology to, to intensify or not has to do with politics. So that's why we need to look at the politics and what's going on in the region. Um, states react in, in terms of their technology purchases to politics. And what you're talking about is a reflection of the deteriorating regional political environment. Could you please clarify, exact, clarify exact, exactly what, when you say that China is following a neo-realist foreign policy, could you, um, could you please clarify what are the three main assumptions you are making when you, are, okay, uh, um, when you state that premise? Because it really, if one looks at Waltzian neo-realism, that I, I, Waltz doesn't, doesn't necessarily believe in applying neorealism to, for, to, to foreign policy. Well, again, Walter's neorealism is, is primarily at least systemic. So can you just cl clarify what are the three main assumptions you're making when you believe that China is follow, it's following the, the, these present course of actions? Chinese foreign policy is occurring in a context which is anarchical. There's no world government. So this, we're getting a bit theoretical about this. Um, China is primarily a security maximizing state. Um, therefore, our concern should be with the concept of a security dilemma, which I talked a little bit about, so that's three aspects. Uh, it's a very helpful intervention on your part because, as you know, with neo-realists, you get the offensive version under Mersheimer, and you get the Waltzian version. I'm advancing a Waltzian-type version, and I'm talking, the reason why I mentioned Colin Elman, is, Colin Elman is because he talked about how you can use neorealism as a theory of foreign policy, which is basically what I'm using. If you check out his Security Studies article in 1996. That but isn't developed. this resulting in a rather overly sim simplistic understanding? Aren't you removed by trying to, 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 to present a very simple scientific, scientific understanding of Chinese foreign policy? Aren't you, aren't you removing the nuance and the, co and the historical ideation and normative co context, which is inevitably in play whenever you, you see China as, a, as both an actor and as an actor, and, and the way in which China, China behaves, behaves in international society. True. That's why I talk about the need to respect history, which I kicked off the. But Walt doesn't believe in history. <laughs> but well, Walt can take any position he wants. But I, as a neo-realist who studies Chinese foreign policy and, and also you know, took the trouble to learn the Chinese language, uh, have to believe that you need to respect Chinese history. And I think if you look at Chinese history, you can make a case, and I think a rather strong one, that they have been a security maximizer along the kind of Waltzian premise of states maximizing uh, their security. Now, what is the alternative to taking a, uh, not taking a theoretical approach? It will be a, an approach that is atheoretical. Uh, and you know, I'd say good luck with that. Uh, and I think that as I started out and kicked off, you need to understand the world through some kind of lens. And we do so whether we say we do or not. Thank you. Spiros Polycandrio, this Van Dijn Holman. I just have a question. I'm looking at China's um, rise in the, in, the, in the Asian region and the world. Um, and that power transition that comes with it. Um, and my question is, do you think China, within that context, will be able to build and lead alliances uh, similar to NATO or similar mm -hmm. to the Western European Union or any other kind yeah. of, uh, or whether that transition will be an unilateral yeah. assumption of hegemony? Excellent question. One of the Achilles heel in Chinese foreign policy in the contemporary international system is the relatively uh, small number of states that ally with it. Now, states will trade with China. Um, some of the research that I did for this paper suggested that uh, in 2011, nine, uh, 77 states in the system were either China's number one or number two trading partner. That figure has actually gone up. Yet at the same time, 
we'd be hard pressed to identify formal alliances that China has with states, as opposed to the United States. The United States has a network of alliances in Asia alone. This is a tremendous source of power that the United States has in the region. And I would argue that the alliance system actually serves as a mechanism to actually uh, solidify the stability of the system. Now, this is not without any caveats, because as I pointed out, the United States therefore needs to manage its alliances very well. But at the same time, I think the history since 1945 of the region has shown that alliances have stabilized the system uh, in East Asia. So moving forward, uh, you know, that's an excellent question. What it does mean, therefore, in more kind of specific terms, if the Chinese want to balance US power, what do they do? They don't have alliances, right? Alliances are used to balance the power of other states. It means, therefore, the Chinese have to rely on what's called internal balancing, which is basically bolstering their own military capabilities and their economy. So moving forward, um, I would say if I were a strategist in Beijing, I'd work to develop alliances. And that would be something to look at moving forward. Thanks. Thanks for that question. Now, I think we've got time for a couple of more questions. Nick, this is all your fault. <laughs> this is what happens when you warm an audience up. Um, we, had, we had one here. And maybe we'll have a couple more, one there and then one there. Thank Obviously, you. from your presentation, the centrality of the role of the United States in the whole region is, yes. is a key. What do you think will be the effect of the United States getting distracted in other strategic scenarios, like the one emerging now in Eastern Europe again, yeah. and the Middle East? Excellent question. Um, I'm involved in track two discussions for the Asia New Zealand Foundation. Um, and uh, we've had discussions with uh, colleagues, Japan, Vietnam, India, other countries in the region. And one of the interesting things that's come out of, of these discussions is how concerned some of these states are, and I won't go beyond uh, that, uh, at how they perceive the United States is so distracted by the Middle East that uh, it's not paying attention to developments in the region and allowing instability to fester and escalate. Uh, and, you know, sure, the United States eventually comes in and intervenes, but way too late in Asia. So therefore, for example, this uh, situation with Sino-Japanese relations. Um, I can see how a, a Japanese perspective would be that the United States isn't paying enough attention to our security, and then it comes in the last minute and, uh, after our prime minister visits the shrine and effectively, um, uh, you know, uh, tries to actually uh, criticize us, right? Uh, albeit behind the scenes. So there's interlinkage between international relations of the Middle East and the international relations of East Asia. Uh, very important linkage um, that we need to pay more attention to. Uh, and I, I'd say that from the Obama administration's perspective, this is probably one of the key issues they need to pay attention uh, because it's not good enough that you have two major regions of the world that are destabilized. Thank you very much, Pablo Milevsky, Ambassador of Poland. And not to leaving too much international politics and Europe, uh, you mentioned in your presentation the uh, speaking of speaking of the great powers in different uh, different regions. You you mentioned Russia in Europe and China in, in, in Asia. It one it might be a bit misleading having in keeping in mind that it was a different history, especially mm. in the 80s and 90s, both in Soviet Union and Russia and in China, and, and there was a different kind of a, a kind of a background um, uh, on, on these two countries, and the weight is different. Geopolitic, I mean, uh, economic uh, economic weight of Russia in Europe is much different than the Chinese right. weight in, in, in Asia. Um, I would I would like to ask you the question on on this bilateral relations between China and Russia, as mm. um, as um, uh, there is a kind of maybe not alliance as you. As you said, that China is not having an alliance, but the closer relationship between these two countries. Uh, how do you see the development of these relations in the future, also in the context of balancing the U.S. U.S. in the in the in the in the Asian Asian region? Thank you. Um, one of the interesting questions, which I actually mentioned before, is if you look at it in pure power terms, why haven't the Chinese and the Russians? got together to reestablish the alliance they had during the Cold War, or some kind of other type of relationship, close relationship, to balance against the United States. They clearly are fed up with US intervention in their affairs. I think we can agree, 
right, on multiple issues they disagree uh, with the United States, and they see eye to eye on a number of issues. But at the same time, I think history, this is where history matters. The, uh, the psychological damage done to the Chinese-Russian relationship as a result of the breaking apart of the alliance in the late 50s, early 60s, uh, is a big factor why they don't actually establish uh, an alliance relationship. Now, history explains part of that, but also uh, you need to look at geography. In, in the present day, on geographical reasons alone, uh, you could suspect that there will be some degree of tension between China and Russia, right? So in terms of history and in strategy, the fact that two states share a common border uh, pretty much guarantees that there will be some degree of suspicion. The reason why the United States is not uh, raising the hackles of a lot more states in the international system is that in the post-Cold War era is that geographically, the United States is far away from many states. Uh, unless you're Mexico or Canada, you know, in terms of geographic terms, you're not too concerned about the United States. Uh, but whenever you share a border with another state, uh, then you, you are concerned, right? So uh, in terms of history and geography, I, I can explain why uh, Russia and China have some degree of a close relationship, but at the same time, there are limits to that relationship. Does it help to answer the question? And the US factor, I mean, the, 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 the balance in the US power in, in, in Asia, how do you see the, the, the Russian-China relations in this, in this regard? Um, how they may manage to, well, I don't think they're balancing together against, uh, against the United States in Asia. I think the Chinese are doing that on themselves. They're not, the Chinese are certainly not depending on the Russians to balance against the United States in Asia, right? Now, I, I've read some press reports that recently the Russians have begun to uh, express an interest in, in Asia and taking on a greater role in Asian security, right? After all, they're part of the six-party talks with North Korea. But interestingly enough, uh, the Chinese are quite suspicious of the Russians taking a more active role in Asia. So moving forward, uh, you know, um, that actually may be something the United States want to think about. Uh, Paul Hubbard here, a student at the ANU. I've just got a question about policy implications. And China may not be um, a, a trading nation in the definition that you've used, but Australia and New Zealand probably are, and we're lucky enough not to share a land border in Asia. Um, the treasurer and trade minister in China at the moment, I mean, should they be arguing for anything other than maximisation of Australia's economic in interests? Can we afford just to leave the, the great power politics to the great powers? Um, the, the question is not, can Australia uh, choose to kind of leave out the great power politics aspect of it? Because um, that will come eventually be, through the Chinese emphasizing it, right? Um, so it's not a case of Australia having a choice or not. If events uh, or situations develop to a point where they get so intense, uh, it would be surprising if you don't get a situation whereby the Chinese and say some other power of the United States uh, ask states to choose sides. Now, the, the key then is not to allow the situation to get to that point where states start asking other states to choose sides, because that's back to Cold War stuff, like the 70s and 80s, right? So that places a premium on wise and effective diplomacy now before we get to a crisis situation. But at the same time, I would point out there is an interesting um, phenomenon that's going on in the region, which is uh, states that are uh, deeply engaged economically in trade are also highly suspicious of each other in security terms. So there is a divergence, right? In Europe, you have, um, I think, a much better situation where states that trade with each other also have quite deep security ties. So for example, through NATO. In Asia, it's actually the opposite. So that's a very interesting kind of contrast. Thank you, Nick. Um, I don't think we've exhausted the, speak the questions. We haven't exhausted the topic. We may have exhausted our speaker, so I think perhaps we, we should call it quits. I'd like to remind you that the talk will be on the web, so please have a look for that. Uh, and I'd like also to invite you to look at our website, to look at our forthcoming talks. 
uh, they're, they're well advertised and we'd certainly like to see you back again, hopefully on a, on a night that's not quite so grim as it was, as it's been tonight. And I'd like you to join me in, th in, in, in thanking Nick for a talk that was refreshing, it was very clear, and might I even dare to suggest that it was realistic. <laughs> Nick, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.